Hello everyone, my name is Franziska Bonat and I'm very happy that Gisela is with us today from the University of Tübingen and she is giving us an overview of what NFCore Airflow can do. Yeah, thanks Franziska for the nice introduction. So I'll present NFCore Airflow. And first of all, I will start with defining like what's the air in Airflow. So air stands for adaptive immune receptor repertoire. And that's the collection of membrane proteins that are found on the surface of B cells, in which they are case B, they are called PCR, and on the surface of T cells, in which case they are called uh, TCRs or T cell receptors. And uh, BCRs or B cell receptors in their secreted form are also called antibodies, which is a term that we are all more familiar with. So the main function of these receptors is to be able to recognize foreign antigens that are inside the human body that can come, for example, from pathogens such as viruses or bacteria and to elicit an immune response against them. And to be able to recognize so many different uh, antigens from different pathogens, uh, these receptors also have to have a variety of different sequences. And so it's estimated that in the human body at, at, at the time point, there is 10 billion to 100 billion different receptor sequences, PCRs and TCRs. And um, AR sequencing is about getting the individual sequences of these um, B cell and T cell receptors. And that has a variety of applications, which can vary from determining the immune state of an individual at a specific point, studying immune related diseases, guiding vaccine development, or guiding cancer immunotherapy. So I'm going to talk about a bit more detail on how this diversity of the TCRs and PCRs is generated. So in the human genome, there are uh, different B uh, gene segments, D gene segments, and J gene segments that can be, and C gene segments that can be combined to form these TCR and BCR receptors. In case of humans, there's four TB genes segments, uh, 23 D gene segments, and six J gene segments. And what happens in the B cells and T cells is that the, um, each one segment of each kind is combined to form a productive TCR or PCR receptor. And um, that happens at the DNA level. So there's a process that's called somatic recombination that alters the genome of the cells and, and generates this uh, productive TCR and PCR receptors. And the combination of these different, uh, different gene segments doesn't happen like label blocks, just like attaching them one and next to each other, but rather in a cut and paste procedure and the cutting um, position is not exactly always at the same uh, spot. And there can also be some nucleotides um, in, incorporated into these junction regions so that there's extra variability that comes from, from this step that is also not genome encoded. And in the case of the B cells or in B cell receptor, there's even another process that generates more diversity of these receptors that happens upon antigen stimulation. So that's what happened to all of us, for example, when we were first in contact with the coronavirus or the coronavirus vaccine. Um, some B cells in the body were able to recognize um, the antigens in the coronavirus and they were stimulated and underwent clonal expansion. And that is generating a lot of um, children cells that belong to the same B cell clone then. And, and in a manner that not all of these children cells have the exact same BCR receptor sequences, but there's a process called somatic hypermutation that introduces uh, mutations in these BDJ uh, segments so that um, each of the children cells has a slightly different receptor sequence as well. And this allows also to generate um, B cell receptors and therefore antibodies that have even higher affinity to the original antigen. Um, so you've seen that um, there's many different processes that contribute to uh, the diversity of these TCR and BCR sequences, including somatic recombination, variable junction length, and in the case of the BCRs, also somatic hypermutation. And this means that theoretically there could be more than 10 to the power of 14 possible uh, BCR sequences. Uh, so how do we, how are they the, uh, sequenced? Um, most protocols use what's called amplicon sequencing, which is the targeted amplification of this gene locus. 
And that can be done via different protocols, including multiplex PCR, so providing primers, primers for all the kinds of different sequences that can be there, but also five, five prime race amplification protocols are, are pretty common. And also the sequencing protocols can uh, incorporate what's called unique molecular identifiers, which allow correcting for sequencing errors uh, down the line and errors introduced by the PCR amplification process. And typically for sequencing, um, MySec sequencers are used because they allow for a longer uh, read length that covers the complete PDJ and beginning of the C um, region. Um, so how is the bioinformatic analysis done uh, for this kind of sequences? It typically does not happen like a traditional RNA-seq analysis, and that's because read mapping to a reference genome is challenging in this case uh, due to the high diversity of these PCR and TCR sequences, and also because it's a highly repetitive uh, genome region with all of these B, D, and J gene segments there. So for this kind of analysis, um, specific tools are used and the uh, reads are aligned to specific reference data also for these PCR and TCR receptors. Um, so I always say, luckily for us, like when wanting to uh, write a pipeline to do this kind of analysis, there's already plenty of tools out there that can analyze this data. One of uh, the better well-known ones is the incantation framework that is developed by the Kleinstein lab in Yale. And it's an open source tool set to analyze ARSIC data from beginning to end. Uh, there's a whole community of users already using this framework. And here you can also get the details in case you want to have more information. Um, so thanks to developing this pipeline as part of the NFCO community, we gained visibility. And uh, we quickly found quite some collaborators uh, to develop the pipeline. So I want to mention that this is really a community-based development effort. Um, Susanna Marquez from the uh, incantation um, lab uh, joined quite at the beginning, and also David Ladd from Monash University helped in, uh, in adding some features there, uh, whereas initially um, Alex Belsa, when he was still at Cubic with us, um, Simon Hoymos and myself were also developing the airflow pipeline. Um, so now to the details of the pipeline. Um, those are the main uh, pipeline steps. First, when the pipeline can process both bulk um, AR sequencing data and single cellar sequencing data. When starting from bulk, there's first a step of quality control of the sequencing reads and um, sequence assembly. And um, afterwards, there's a process of um, that where the reads are aligned to the references with, a, with IGBLAST. And the reference data is typically employed from the IMGT. Um, consortia, which provides reference data for BCR and TCR. Um, at this step, also already assembled data can also be provided. And for single cell data, typically we start at this, at this step. So afterwards, there's a step for clonal analysis, which identifies which of the sequences of the PCR um, belong to which B cell clone. So it assigns the individual BCR sequences and TCR sequences to their uh, specific clone. And in the case of the B cells, it can also perform lineage reconstruction of the whole B cell clone. And finally, there's a step for um, reporting, doing repertoire analysis and reporting, including QC reports via multi QC. So that's like the pipeline general steps. But now, if we look a bit more detail, there is like a ton more processes, uh, individual processes that uh, are part of the pipeline. And I'm going to explain them a bit in more detail now. So starting for the QCN sequence assembly, um, the pipeline supports different uh, sequencing protocols, including multiplex PCR, in which the users have to provide the B and C primer sequences that were used for the amplification, or in the case of five prime rays, providing the C primer and the linker sequencing uh, sequences for, for amplification. And both protocols are supported uh, with and without UMI barcodes. And the barcodes can also be pro uh, provided in different configurations. So starting from the raw sequencing data, then a sample sheet uh, needs to be provided that contains sample information and the individual FASCI files for all samples. Um, so then depending of if the, the sequencing protocol includes UMI barcodes or doesn't include them, 
there will be some processes or others, but they all start with quality control of the reads with FastQC, um, filtering the sequences by quality, by a quality threshold, masking the primer sequences. And um, if a UMI-based protocol is used, then a, um, a consensus is built from all the sequences that have the same UMI barcode. And this way, it also allows to correct for the errors, as I mentioned before. Um, there is also an extra procedure um, that is employed whenever there, whenever it's, um, it's estimated that the length of the UMI barcodes will not be sufficient to cover all of the diversity of the sample. And that is um, bypassed by clustering first all the sequences by similarity and annotating the cluster ID. And then um, two different sequences with the same UMI barcode can also be distinguished this way. So after um, building the consensus, then um, all the sequences that contain the same UMI barcode are collapsed and uh, count the number of sequences with the same UMI barcode is annotated. Um, other metadata is also annotated and also duplicate sequences with different UMI barcodes are also collapsed and their count is annotated, which can also be used for, for filtering there. After this step, there comes the VDJ assignment and filtering step. And here it's also possible to start with already assembled sequences that can also be provided with a sample sheet and FASTA files and also typically single cell uh, sequencing start, um, data processing starts at this step. And this is because um, the pipeline supports directly the output from the tool 10x genomic cell ranger multi, which provides um, what incorporating also TCR and BCR sequencing um, in the in the 10x genomics um, sequencing procedure. Then the output of that tool is the air rearrangement table, which contains all of the sequences there. Um, and so that can also be directly provided to the pipeline at that step. And option, so that step, what it does, it um, assigns, well, it um, aligns the, the sequences to the IMGT reference, and it then assigns what exact B, D, and J segments were used there. And in the case of the single cell data, there's an option, this uh, gene reassignment um, step is optional. So, after alignment to the IMGT reference, there's also a number of uh, quality filtering steps that are performed. First, the lock, um, it's checked that the locus matches exactly the, the peak call, so the, the VBJ, VB, B uh, segment assignment, that there are a minimum of 200 informative positions, maximum 10% and nucleotides, that the sequences that are um, determined are productive, that the junction region is multiple is a multiple of three amino acids, and there is also a possibility of um, removing chimeric rates, detecting contamination across samples, and finally collapsing duplicate se sequences if there's any. So plenty of quality filters uh, as part of the pipeline. Um, the next step is clone analysis. In that case, um, and hierarchical clustering is used based on the Hamming distances between sequences, and the pipeline is also able to auto detect um, a Hamming distance threshold that can be used to determine which sequences are part of the same clone or are part of different clones. And there is also a step for lineage reconstruction of the um, clonal lineage trees. And uh, new new recently added are, well, so, so recently the pipeline uses the Enchanter tool, which is developed by Susanna Market in Incantation, and that tool uh, provides calls to other Incantation tools and also nice reports for each of these steps. So I invite you to check them out here. And finally, there is a repertoire analysis step. Um, there, an R markdown report is provided that um, summarizes the repertoire analysis results for all samples. And here of notice is also that um, it can all, a custom R markdown report can also be provided in case that the user wants to change some things in this report. So it's also possible to provide an own R markdown file. And other reports um, of this reporting analysis steps is the multi QC QC report for all samples from the um, read quality control reports. So here we will see an example of um, this repertoire analysis report. Uh, first, there's a summary of all the samples used for the analysis and 
clonal abundance and clonal diversity are reported together with vision usage. And finally, all of the tools that are used um, in, as part of the pipeline and their citations are noted here to make it really easy for users of the pipeline to also cite the original tools that are being used there. Um, as you know, all documentation for NFCore Airflow can be found on the NFCore website. Um, so check it out if you want to use it there. There are also some example results of the pipeline when the full tests are run on AWS. And what's next for this pipeline? So stay tuned for a new release that comes real soon. Uh, we hope this week or in the next uh, week and that it includes more quality control and reporting as part of the Enchanter tool, as I've mentioned, by Susanna Marquez, and code refactoring using sub workflows. And at this point, I would like to thank all the contributors to the pipeline, uh, Simon, Simon Hoimos and myself at Cubic, um, Alex Belsa, who was initially at Cubic, but now is at Beringa Ingelheim, uh, Susanna Marquez at the Kleinsheim Lab in Yale, uh, David Latt, and Monash University and some collaborations also at the University of Tübingen, Christoph Ruschel and Markus Kovarik. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to join us, join the Airflow channel um, on the NFCore Slack. And if you have any questions related to the implantation tools here, you also have the contact and emails to contact them directly. Thank you very much. Um, everyone can now unmute themselves if there are any questions. Um, maybe I, I start with one. I'm curious, um, in what format does Airflow expect UMIs to be, pro be provided? So does it have to be in a separate file or should it be in read one or in read two? Um, the, it supports all kinds of these configurations that you have mentioned. So you can provide them. It, it depends on, the, on your library design where the UMI barcodes are located. Uh, sometimes they are part of the R1 and R2 reads, and sometimes they are part of the index reads, so it can be provided in any way. There's just there's some parameters in the pipeline where you can specify where the UMI barcode is located, R1 read, R2 read, or index files, so everything is supported in that case. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? It doesn't seem so. Then I would like to thank, of course, Gisela, but also um, the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative for funding the Bite Size Talks. And as usual, if you have any questions, go to Slack um, for at uh, NFCore Airflow and uh, ask questions there. And then thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Francesca.